Good morning. Uh, welcome to Rao Online. Today's topic is pregnancy-induced hypertension. So, in a normal pregnant woman, because of the fall in the systemic vascular resistance as a result of the progesterone in normal pregnancy, there is a fall in the systolic and diastolic blood pressures. So, both systolic and diastolic blood pressure decline in normal pregnancy, reaching a nadir at 24 to 28 weeks. And then they start a little rise, but but never return to the pre-pregnancy band. So, throughout the pregnancy, the blood pressure sh should be normal than a non-pregnant individual. Now, this fall is more in the diastolic pressure as compared to the systolic pressure. So, normal pregnancy has got a low blood pressure as compared to a non-pregnant individual. Arterial blood pressure will never get elevated in uh, normal pregnancy. However, there are a few pregnancies in which blood pressure do get elevated and these causes maternal death and in fact this is the cause of maternal death in 18 percent of cases. So, pregnancy induced hypertension is a hypertension that develops as a direct re result of pregnancy. Pregnancy induced hypertension can include gestational hypertension that is just rise in blood pressure without a proteinuria, it can include preeclampsia which can be primary or secondary, it can include eclampsia. Now, the word eclampsia comes from a Greek word which means lightning, thunder lightning or convulsions. So, in a patient with high blood pressure and proteinuria, if they throw a seizure, it is called as eclampsia and a condition which predisposes to seizures is called as preeclampsia. So, how do we classify hypertension in pregnancy? So, Hypertension in pregnancy is defined as blood pressure of more than 140 systolic and 90 diastolic. Before 20 weeks of gestation, it, it is usually a chronic hypertensive individual who has become pregnant or it is an atypical preeclampsia in case of molar pregnancies. So, uh, pregnancy induced hypertension is defined as systolic more than 140 or diastolic more than 90 in an individual more than 20 weeks of pregnancy. So, before 20 weeks of gestation, if the patient has no proteinuria or a stable proteinuria, we are dealing with a case of chronic hypertension. Before 20 weeks of gestation, if there is proteinuria or blood pressure, then it is a preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension. After 20 weeks of gestation, if there is proteinuria, it is called as preeclampsia and if there is no proteinuria after 20 weeks of gestation, it is called as gestational hypertension. So, coming to the first category, gestational hypertension, what is the obstetrical triad? Pregnancy is more than 20 weeks, patient has hypertension, but there is no proteinuria. So, gestational hypertension is sustained elevation of blood pressure more than 140-90 after 20 weeks of pregnancy without proteinuria and postpartum the blood pressure returns to normal. There is no symptoms of preeclampsia like headache, epigastric pain or visual disturbances and general and systemic examination and lab reports are normal and proteinuria is absent. In a preeclampsia, the obstetrical triad consists of pregnancy more than 20 weeks, hypertension and proteinuria of more than 300 milligrams in 24 hours and there is something called as PCR, protein creatinine ratio more than 0.3. So, urinary PCR more than 0.3 and this uh, preeclampsia is also uh, accompanied by hemoconcentration which is evidenced by rise in hematocrit, blood urea nitrogen, rise in hemoglobin, rise in serum creatinine and serum uric acid. In preeclampsia, there are two varieties, the mild variety and the severe variety. So, if there is a deranged liver enzymes or evidence of DIC, the straight away becomes a severe preeclampsia. Uh, even mild preeclampsia can progress to severe preeclampsia with no time. There is no variety like a moderate variety. Now, factors which predispose some women to this disease, I will discuss them. Then I will also discuss about the progression of gestational hypertension into severe preeclampsia or eclampsia, which happens occasionally. And we will also discuss the pathophysiology of preeclampsia and eclampsia. We will also discuss the maternal community and health service factors that can influence the survival of women and reduce the maternal mortality. We will also discuss the maternal and fetal complications associated with severe preeclampsia and eclampsia. So, what are the predisposing factors? 
one is the maternal factors the community factors and the health service factors so uh, how do we take care of uh, maternal factors to prevent the maternal mortality due to preeclampsia if the patient is a hypertensive tell them not to become pregnant till the blood pressure is controlled in the community we can spread awareness and tell them that if your blood pressure is high during pregnancy please come to the clinic then we should also make our clinics adequately equipped with uh, anti hypertensive agents and magnesium sulfate and anti seizure medication so how do we identify a preeclampsia in a woman who has come to the obg opd first is we have to correctly measure the blood pressure we have to correctly measure the protein in the urine we have to do a routine screening that means every pregnant woman should be screened for preeclampsia and always test reflexes so if the ex reflexes are exaggerated and she may have a chance of throwing a fit so what is the diagnostic criteria for preeclampsia absolute rise of blood pressure more than 140 90 systolic pressure rise of more than 30 diastolic pressure rise of more than 150 in pregnancy we take the carat cough 5 fifth sound and not the carat cough 4 then this rise in blood pressure should be on two occasion 6 hours apart and then we calculate based on the mean arterial pressure so what is mean arterial pressure it is diastolic pressure plus 1/3 of pulse pressure so a rise of 20 mm of mean arterial pressure is also considered to be hypertension in pregnancy if an absolute value of mean arterial pressure is more than 105 that is also considered as hypertension in pregnancy